It, it's an exciting webinar, I think, tonight. I'm excited about it because we're talking about effective student collaboration. And we know it's quite a complex environment at the moment that we're dealing with. We've got both online learning occurring in some states in Australia and also overseas as well. And then we've also got face-to-face -face teaching. So we'll be talking about collaboration in both those two modes tonight. We've had an overwhelmingly positive response to this webinar tonight with over 450 registrations and over 37 questions. And you're joining us from every state and territory across Australia and also we have international visitors as well. So please let us know where you're joining us here from tonight. So I'd like to start off by acknowledging that for me personally, we're meeting on the lands of the Gadigal people um, of the Aura Nation and pay my respects to Elders past, present, future and emerging. You'll all have different countries that you're meeting on today and I'd like you to acknowledge those places that we're all meeting on tonight. So within this webinar, we're going to really look at and keep this as practical as possible. The three presenters here tonight, we all have a teaching background. Some of us are still currently teaching, such as Matthew and leading. Um, and we want this to be as practical as possible. <laughs> and I'll be introducing them very soon. Um, so we'll be looking at what are some techniques, what are tasks, what are some approaches that you can help students work together remotely? How can we create effective collaboration and problem solving between different student groups? And how can we encourage and support, especially those students that are currently lower achieving in collaborative tasks, especially during um, remote learning? So within the with this, I'll hand over to um, Dr. Pauline Ho, who's going to talk us through some of the research on remote and learning, remote learning. Thanks, Tanya. So, oh, hi, everyone. Pleasure. I would need, Tanya, your help to click when I, you know, we do the next image when that time comes. So, basically, we are discussing a very important but yet very interesting topic today on student collaboration. And as we know, student relationships at this time is really important. It's probably more important than ever. So staying connected with each other as teachers and even between with our students and student to student, is critical to build those positive relationships to help each other learn and to be socially connected with one another so that when our students return back to schools, they are safe and well. Um, of course, the basis of any collaboration is interaction as it's John Dewey says that education is a social process and so students need to make those connections between what is being learned and the decisions that they make. Um, well, interestingly, but yet challengingly, we need to reimagine what this looks like in different learning and teaching models that we are experiencing that right now. So what we have here, uh, firstly, is a school online, fully school online, where now schools are transforming their teaching to to from a classroom to fully online. And we know that a lot of schools say that, you know, all the, they have all this, um, a lot of schools have these online platforms and access to technology sorted out and they might just want to readapt them to a fully online curriculum and run those classrooms business as usual. So how does this look like for student collaboration? Um, in a very generous sense, this might look like um, groups of students having discussions over, um, Google Meet, Zoom, or even a whiteboard, and um, synchronous teaching, uh, live discussions between teachers and students. And then we have the schools offline, which is on the right side of the slide, where it's really interesting that some schools in more unique settings, uh, where they find that um, technology access might be a problem, and that some students have little access to computers and other devices, which is exasperated by the um, COVID-19 um, to, and they have to stay connected with one another. So how do they do that? So schools might prepare physical packs of learning, stationary, and hand it out to parents to support learning continuously. And then what we have in the middle is a sort of a blended learning situation where schools feel, well, we want to mesh 
two of these best you know, kinds of learning from both sides into one. Um, this is probably one of the most common uh, model that schools are experiencing right now. And schools might think about the possibilities where they could do synchronous and asynchronous learning together to achieve better learning connections. This might look like students having online discussions, uh, but also having the time to do independent preparation on the side, you know, uh, come asynchronously through research. So that when they come together, they are prepared with the learning content and the, um, and the preparation to, to participate in group discussions. So if we go on to the next slide, these are just some uh, elements that we think, oh, I think the, yeah, there are some elements that we think student collaboration uh, would look like, whether you are in a remote or in-person learning situation. Uh, some of you have asked whether there is a difference between that and if remote, what does remote learning what does student collaboration look like in a remote setting? But I, I think that there are lots of um, connections between the two of them. And there are certain things that we do in person learning that definitely could be incorporated. And if they're good learning teaching practices, they should be also incorporated in the remote setting. But of course, we have to think of how that will work out in terms of the platforms and how that can be delivered to the students. So one of the learning designs that we can think about in a remote setting is thinking two, one, two, flexible learning. So where you can have, uh, in one of the case studies that we found through our evidence review work, we do think we, there are some cases where schools think about flexible forms of learning where two days can be used for um, asynchronous preparation and students do independent work to prepare for learning and then have one day to come together to have those discussions and you can do breakouts through those Zoom meetings and Google Meet. Uh, in the real in-person learning, that could mean having station rotations in class. So within the classrooms, teachers and students could, students could rotate between different activities. So from whole class teaching, breaking out into independent learning through computer work, and then going into group work and rotating that so that learning becomes more engaging. Um, of course, we could also think about how we could use strategies like think pair share, fishbowl debate, and jigsaw strategies. And um, we can do it in both remote and in-person learning. In remote settings, this, this could be used in situations where you have uh, students coming together in small group discussions rather than a whole class learning, where they talk through some of the research uh, work that do, the projects they're doing or in solving problems. Um, and think about how you could layer those conversations uh, and the tasks that you are giving to your students. So instead of having one problem, think about the different ways you could layer that through um, face learning. So having them to think about the setting, presenting them a problem and then providing the structure for them to do the research, come together to solution together. And I was, I'm a big, great believer that, you know, although learning can be personalized, it should be always stimulating and challenging so that our students have the chance to progress in their learning. And especially for students with uh, low ability, we do not box them into a box to say, this is where they're at in terms of their um, understanding, but be able to push them towards the next level of um, challenging questions. Um, just running through quickly for the next three, items there, we, I think one of the most critical thing that across all effective interventions that we saw in the evidence base is that they always come with regular check-ins. So regardless of how learning design is being built, teachers are always there to provide their ongoing feedback, um, finding ways and opportunities to check in with groups, whether it's individually or in twos or threes, and to fill those gaps in learning. And feedback assessment, that's what we just mentioned. And thinking about, about those value added technology where you could provide asynchronous learning uh, to build into life, uh, to, to discussions when they come together as a group. Over to you, Tanya. You're on mute. 
<laughs> Apologies. Uh, thank you so much, Pauline. You've given us a great introduction into some of the different techniques that can be used in collaboration. What I would like to see now is um, everyone just have a go at the way you would define collaboration currently. Just pop that into the chat box and I'll read a couple of them out as we go. Everyone working together. Lovely. Exactly. That's right. Common goal. Common goal. I think that's excellent as well. It's really thinking about how as students working collectively more powerfully than they can separately. Sharing and building on ideas. Lovely. It's exactly what you're doing in the chat right now, here right now. Mutual goals. Yep. Contributing it to a shared task towards a common goal. Yes, maximise strengths, minimise weaknesses. And these are things as well that we apply um, within our workplace as well. Thank you, keep them up. I'm going to move on to the next slide because I'm mindful that I really want to get to the panel discussion. Thank you, amazing answers. So the way we define it within the toolkit is um, exactly like you said. So students working together, um, in a small group so that everyone has a really distinct and unique task that they need to fulfill. Um, in some collaborative approaches, they put mixed ability teams or groups to work and they also use competition to drive more effective collaboration. But I'll make a note about not overplaying that competition in a second. Um, Online collaboration, I think Pauline summed this up really well. It's, it's how can we do what we do within the classroom online as effectively as possible. So this is the impact of collaborative learning. Those of you that have been with us here before, this is from the Teaching and Learning Toolkit. This is a meta-meta analysis. And what we can see here, it's a low cost for a very high evidence security. So we've got a really low large depth and breadth of evidence. So a lot of recent meta-analyses have been completed in this field. We can see there's a nice impact of plus five months worth of learning. This is uh, came from a calculation of a mean weighted effect size of 0.38. I love effect sizes, maybe not all of you do, but there it is for the night. Um, anyone wants to know what effect size is, put it into the chat box and Susanna will let you know. But don't get me started as we'll never get to the panel. Um, and key elements of collaborative learning. So students need support and practice to work together. It's like any skill we teach within the classroom. We don't just teach it once and we're done with it. We have to scaffold and help our students to learn how to work together as effectively as possible. We do this with all skills and it's just as important with collaborative working together skills. Um, tasks need to be designed effectively. I think as teachers, we know that planning bit is really always key to effective teaching. And we need to make sure it's efficient and we need to make sure that every person has a separate part to bring to the task as a whole so that we don't get any students that just drop off and let the rest do the work um, or just disengage with the process, which can be difficult. Um, competition can be useful, but not to the point where it becomes more important than the learning goal. Um, particularly important to help those students that are currently lower achieving to be able to articulate their learning needs and articulate the learning to the other learners because we know that in explaining something to someone else, we know that from being teachers and educators, we learn a lot more from that process. And have you um, considered what professional learning and development is required for your school in this. And these are all things that we're about to dive into in great detail now. So these are some of the resources that we've worked up in response to support your questions. You'll see your questions up on the screen. But first of all, I have the greatest pleasure in announcing our fantastic panel that we have with us here tonight. 
I'll start off with introducing um, Matthew. Very pleased to have Matthew here. He's one of the, <laughs> great to have you here, Matthew. Thank you for the way. He's one of um, the assistant principals at Western Port Secondary College, and that's on the Mornington Peninsula in Victoria, Australia, for those of you from overseas. Um, Matthew has taught in several different Victorian schools from across the state. He's also a Victorian Curriculum Assessment Authority assessor um, for both English and the General Achievement Test. So that's a centralised body in Victoria that comes together and reports on all the grading for 11 and 12. Um, while he's had he has previous and current roles have allowed for experience across all ex aspects of school operations. His passion, and that's why we're particularly pleased to have him here tonight, is really about improving teaching and learning through developing staff capacity, which is the crucial role we know from Robinson's work of a leader. And in addition to his undergraduate degrees, Matthew has completed a graduate diploma of psychological studies, a master's of, le of leadership in curriculum and pedagogy, and is currently undertaking and unlocking the potential through Basto Institute, that's a Victorian Institute of Learning um, and Leadership, which includes a certificate of principal preparation from Monash University. And in addition to presenting at educational forums, he's a co-author of a blog that I subscribe to and I highly recommend you subscribe to too. And we'll put the link as one of the further reading links at the end of all this, um, which is called the Thinking About Teaching blog, which he completes with Tom Kane, his colleague. Um, and that really, what I like about that, it really distills the research into a practical um, and quite readable, they're nice and short and sharp, um, but also with practical implications for what actually occurs within the classroom. So wonderful to have you here, Matthew. Thank you for joining us here tonight. Awesome. And we also have my colleague, um, Dr. Pauline Ho. So Pauline has been with us since October 2017 and Pauline heads up our Learning Impact Fund work. So she has overseen the production of over three randomised controlled trials in different states and territories across Australia to produce um, lovely reports with beautiful logic models. Um, prior to working at SVA, Pauline uh, was a teacher practitioner for seven years and Pauline has also worked in the education and health sectors, including organisations such as the Australian Institute for Teaching and School Leadership, AITSL, um, Monash University and the National Institute of Education in Singapore. Her work has primarily focused in on developing evaluative solutions for effective practices. And Pauline graduated with a PhD in education from the University of Sydney, nonetheless, and holds a Bachelor of Arts in Music and English. So we've got quite a few English people here tonight. It's quite nice, isn't it? Balancing out my science. Um, and a Master's in Education from the National Institute of Education in Singapore. And her PhD thesis investigates the impact of policy and curriculum on the academic and social outcomes of disadvantaged students, which was recognised for several fellowship awards. So now let's get to the really exciting bit, which is the panel. We'll have questions up on the screen, but I'll be asking um, broad questions of my panel members, which they'll be responding to. So starting off, I would love to hear a bit more about the context of your school, Matthew. What's it like at um, your school and what would, how would you describe the context and how would you also describe your specific focus on collaboration at, at Western Port Secondary College? Okay, so as you said, Western Port's sort of on the very outer edge of Melbourne on the morning peninsula. So we're in um, lockdown or going into a higher lockdown at the moment. So that's uh, going to present some new challenges, but we've got about 600 plus um, students. And we've got a relatively large school zone. So it includes uh, the more urban areas of Hastings, Tyab, um, some farming, 
families and then also some more coastal communities of Summers um, and Balnarring. Um, our school endeavours to promote an atmosphere of sort of mutual respect and tolerance um, and cooperation that's really underpinned by our um, care values. So that's community achievement and respect. Uh, we run a relatively um, traditional in terms of the subjects uh, curriculum at Year 7 and 8, but have a real focus on um, STEM and collaborative learning, so which really brings it into the 21st century. Uh, our Year 9 program at the college is very around experiential learning. There's obviously a lot of links with the collaborative stuff there. A little bit more challenging this year to get students out on the excursions and doing things with everything that's been happening in the world. Um, that's still our focus. The senior years where I um, work in and look after, um, we've got a real focus on every single student finishing year 12, getting their high school certificate, whether that's our applied or our um, Victorian Certificate of Education, um, either or. And then going on to collect one more piece of paper. And we chat to this, our students around that um, being our um, ticket to, to happiness effectively. And we chat around education in Australia being really um, important link to earnings as a part of that, you know, being able to put food on the table, um, having a car that you don't need to sell three Hail Marys before you, you know, you drive it. Um, but after that point, after you've, you, you get to that, it's about um, being able to give back to your community and, um, you know, spend time with your, your loved ones with a little bit of the extra stuff to football, theatre, whatever it is that you're into, do those sort of things. So um, our school in 2019 um, won the School Improvement Award um, at the Victorian Education Excellence Award. So we've been recognised for some of the hard work we've been doing down here. That's fantastic. Thank you for sharing that context. And it's really exciting to hear of the really strong approach to collaborative learning that you have there. And I also love the drive really for every student because we know that that's one of the number one determinants of future income is that school completion. And we know that that can be difficult when you've come from a background surrounded by disadvantage. So that's really exciting to hear, Matthew. Thank you. So much of the evidence on collaboration is really focused on how to actually group students. And we've touched on some of the key points of that within the introduction. Um, and I'll start with you, Paulie. What do you think are some of the key takeaways to ensure effective collaboration in terms of how do you actually group students and also thinking about when's appropriate for the use of competition and what can that look like? Thanks, Tanya. Those are really interesting questions um, when we first think about how we group and um, use collaborative um, learning usefully. So I think as teachers and educators, we all know without doubt that, you know, collaborative learning is one of the uh, key ingredients for successful learning. Um, and the research does actually back this up. So numerous meta-analysis have shown of hundreds of studies uh, that collaborative learning have a positive impact on learning with effect sizes, uh, which um, Tanya have shared earlier, with uh, from ranging from 0 0.3 to 0 0.7. And that is really highly desirable in the education space um, in, in terms of all the, the breadth and the, the kind of uh, effect sizes that we see. Uh, in terms of groupings, the evidence tells us that small groups of three to five members are typically more effective than having bigger groups, five to seven and above. Uh, and when we group them, we should think about mixed group um, learning, but there's interestingly the Evidence is quite mixed in that area. So medium mobility students tend to do better in homogeneous groups. Uh, but I think, uh, I think as teachers, we, we do want our students to, to learn from each other and to build positive relationships with different students and to be able to draw on each other's strengths. So when teachers mix the groupings, um, they could match students by strengths and their weaknesses and that could help students to collaborate with each other with mixability, diversity, as well as some social capability. And later on, I will speak a bit more about uh, why social capability is so critical for building positive interactions in any collaboration that students engage in. 
Thank you, Pauline. Excellent. Really exciting too. You know, I love a good effect size. So great to hear you talking about effect sizes. Um, Matthew, how does this play out in practice at your school? What type of groupings do you use um, with your seven year, year seven and year eight and year nine students predominantly? I know that's where you're really focused in on that collaborative work. Yeah, so I guess there's a comment I'll make about how we do it and then maybe a bit more broadly. So at seven and eight, um, we've got learning centres um, where students are then doing most of their classes and they're housed in that space for most of the time. Um, and students are often broken into um, ability groups in terms of being independent learners, guided learners um, and supported learners. Uh, it's a little bit different at Year 9 where we run um, the Project 9 on a Friday because it's based around experiential learning. A lot of the, the tasks are team um, based so it, it's much more autonomous in the way that they're um, addressing the, the tasks and I guess that's a bit of a step up from just working in sort of smaller groups, but less task focused. I um, mean, the, the senior sub school, it's um, very much teacher discretion around collaborative um, learning within their domain and their classroom and working out where that it's in their best interests of their students. Um, however, Western Port's a really specific context. And I, I think w when we're talking in education, it, it, there's very hard to find a, a silver bullet for things and you, you've got to make things work in your context you know, your classroom is different from everybody else's classroom. However, I guess in terms of grouping more broadly, the sort of five points that um, I'd consider, um, oh, sorry, six. Uh, the first one being um, that there's prior, prior learning um, and prior knowledge of every student is that you can't um, have two students read exactly the same. So everyone's going to bring something different to the table. Um, but the, the first thing uh, I would consider is, the, is the purpose of your task in line with collaborative learning? Is it going to add value? If yes, absolutely do it. If no, um, park it, don't do it, focus, focus on some you know, explicit teaching, etc. Um, if it requires a, a high level of content knowledge um, and domain specific knowledge, it's possible that similar abilities um, might have some advantage there. Um, however, if you're aiming to develop some more general capability skills or, or soft skills, as Pauline was referring to, um, it's quite possible then so that some you know, quite mixed groups um, work. Uh, but it's also good sometimes to just get students out of their comfort zone. So, you know, in some absolutely random groups, name generator that you can find on the internet, to put people into groups that way. Um, also considering that the last point around students might have different learning intentions even when they're working within the group on the same task. So um, I'm going to give you a fictional example that's based on a few of my real students. We'll call this student Casey, um, who was a really high functioning students, uh, you know, very uh, high aspirations, but um, maybe had some work to do in those sort of social skills. So we sat down and discussed her future and the fact that uh, to do the type of role that she wanted to in the future, she would need some of those soft skills as well as all of the domain skills. Um, so changing her learning intentions, so it, her focus was on managing and leading the group um, is just as important to her learning as some of the domain areas that we were looking at. Fantastic. Love the depth and breadth that you presented there, Matthew. And the specific example of Casey as well and thinking about those individual student needs we know is just so um, just so important yeah excellent and so really when and building on that last question I think and you were beginning to touch on that and you were saying that there are very different approaches and as we would expect across different domains different subject domains that different um, subjects take as they do in their general knowledge building as well. What would you think that um, are distinctions that you could talk about? We just had some very specific questions come in around um, looking at should um, students 
in mathematics be taught collaboration in a different way compared to in English? What does it look like in, say, physical education? Or do you, I'll start first off with you, Matthew, and then I'll move to Pauline on that yeah. question. So I guess the broad comment that I'd make is collaborative learning is a generalised teaching skill. Um, you know, it, it is transferable between subjects. Um, however, I think you, you need to tailor collaborative learning to your specific context and your specific um, class. So there's a couple of examples of some strategies that um, stu uh, sorry that teachers can use with the students. And there's also a comment I'd like to make with failure. Um, so one example that could be seen in a, in a range of different ways uh, is peer evaluation. Um, so personally, when I'm introducing a new technique to, to students, I actually talk about the research. I'll even go to the point of um, talking about effect sizes with, with students, um, but trying to give them something that, that they can get their teeth into and understand why we're approaching this in this way. So um, a great one when we're looking at peer evaluation is Austin's Butterfly. If you haven't seen that, just type that in on Google and there's some really great um, student feedback. Um, but the, the, the peer evaluation that's giving that uh, feedback, um, PE is going to look different from a year nine program from an English class. So in PE, you might have a, a triad of um, students and they might be passing a hockey ball. Um, and then there might be one member there, you know, giving some um, coaching or some feedback. Um, in year nine, this peer evaluation could be reflecting on a, on a team um, research task. Or in English, it might be um, in a pair giving each other uh, some re re reflection or some feedback um, on a paragraph. So all of those by their nature are going to be domain specific. Um, but in all examples, I think there's some, some broad common things that you want to work with there. So students needing to know their domain content. Um, I'd really push um, preloading students with their tier three domain specific words. Um, so I've, I've got to focus on students getting good results at the end of high school and often as an examiner, it's having that word or those couple of words that makes the difference between an okay answer and the right answer or a better answer. Um, also the procedures and protocols. So if, if we're coaching on feedback, it's really important that they're clear and that the learning environment is safe and supportive and also some language scaffolding around um, sentence starters, et cetera, so they're able to do that. Um, another example, um, think pair share, um, just to talk about the complexity of the social environment that, that we're teaching in. Um, so student learning is always more effective when prior knowledge is high but we all often think about prior knowledge being that the content that domain content that we're looking at um, but we also need to think about what other prior knowledge students need to maximize their, their uh, collaborative learning experience so um, knowledge uh, not just of that, that content but of the think pair share so if we're doing a think um, the students know what uh, they should be thinking about on a prompt. What is it? So whether that's some language or the preloading that you've done as a teacher in the discussion of what they're thinking about. Um, when it's pairing, do, do they know how to share as a pair? Has that been modelled and scaffolded um, for them? Do uh, students choose pairs for the first time and work their way up to just being put into random pairs? What do students do if they disagree? Um, and are those their agreed procedures and protocols that they can fall back on for that. Um, share, do students know what it looks like to share in a class? Have you got, you know, are you a hands up class? Are you a no hands up class? Students knowing those agreed procedures. Um, so think pair share is one of the most simple things that we can do in collaborative learning, but it's actually an extremely complex um, process and it seems effortless um, when students uh, know what's expected of them. And I, I, you know, you, I've seen that in um, classes that are in primary school based classes and the kids just know, but the pre-work's been put in there by the teacher so they know how to share. Um, and we only know what supports that those students actually need when we're going through and using formative assessment well. So we know where the students are up to, so we can um, tailor our teaching. The other thing to consider, I think, when we're uh, adjusting our um, strategies is um, persistence. So I'll give you an example of a triple up from earlier in my career I had, I was teaching three year 
10 classes and I had a beautiful collaborative lesson that was whiz bang. Um, you know, if anyone had come in, it had all the bells and whistles. Um, and it was amazing for my first two classes. And on the third class, it completely flopped. It was just a disaster of a lesson. Um, and it gave me the chance to go back and for that class where they're up to, they needed some more scaffolds, they needed some more protocols. Um, so the, the moral of the story, it's okay to try things. Um, it's okay to get it wrong, as long as we're learning from them and the, the kids are learning from them. Mm, you paint, I, I love the complexity that you're painting there and you're really bringing out the art, I think, and the science of teaching, which is, you know, we do trial something, but we need to make sure that we know, A, where our students are at from the formative assessment, B, do they have the content knowledge in order to successfully complete the, um, the collaborative task and C, then do they have the the so-called soft skills in order to collaborate effectively. And I think that's what you're saying there with that, that third class is that they weren't quite ready for that step yet. And I think, I mean, we've all had a third class. <laughs> I've definitely had my, my fair share of um, third classes. We come in and you go, yeah, I've got this. And then you, no, that's fine. It is trial and error. Um, Pauline, would you like to speak to um, similarly how, how do you think those subjects, is there, do you think there's a strong subject to subject variability? Uh, no, I think that um, across all the research that we have, I mean, that I have come across, um, then there's not much variability in terms of, you know, whether collaborative um, learning works better for one subject versus another. I think it's more about implementation and, you know, and as what uh, Matt was just sharing that, it doesn't always work out the way you intend it to be because you need time to refine those strategies. You need time to think about implementation and it's complex because um, collaborative learning shouldn't be seen as a once-off standalone kind of strategy, but something that should be embedded across learning sequence. But I, like, I think I like what Matt was saying earlier that, you know, it's not a hard and fast thing that you have to have collaboration all the time because from research we we have you know found that independent learning is also critical and we know that students do some students do need more time to develop those uh, independent skills and that really helps to contribute back to collaborative activities so if students do not have those ind independent skills to self-regulate their learning to dive into research to, you know, to, to pick up those things that are necessary for them to participate in the, in, in the group discussions, then they will never be able to do that successfully in groups. Uh, and their self-concept probably will be lesser than others and to feel that they are not able to contribute and that everything, you know, just, just don't work out the way we want. And so I think another thing I'd like to build on is um, thinking about the learning design uh, where collaborative learning can happen. So what we have on the screen right now is to think about it as collaboration rather than group work. So collaboration requires one key ingredient, which is interaction. So students need to be meaningfully uh, interacting with one another through the content they're learning rather than just having a discussion or a talk. So it has to be meaningful around the content. So having the prior knowledge that teachers get for that and prepare them before they get into group learning is very, very critical. So that's why I was um, sort of touched on a bit about um, rotations in classrooms and also thinking about that, how you could do that in a remote setting. So thinking about rotation in mixing up things, you know, where you can have classroom discussion, introducing the concept, um, getting students excited about the topic and the subject, and then getting them into groups um, doing, uh, you know, group solving a problem, but also having time for them to do uh, independent learning, maybe even through technolo technology or through computer um, programs, where they build the content through and a program that has been, um, uh, that um, you might have for them, that, is, that the school might have bought. There are many, many interventions that use um, programs that, that help to, to, to supplement the classroom teaching. Uh, in maths and reading, so I, I think I think that's 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 what is important. I think had the learning design where collaborative comes in, and also building those soft skills through um, getting them to 
build positive relationships with one another and checking in with learning is pretty, pretty critical. Yeah, I really like that point that you made that it's really distinct from group work in that it requires interaction to have success. Um, so that, you know, a, I guess one plus one equals three rather than one plus one equals two is the way I conceptualise it. Maybe because I've got a, maybe because I love numbers, but you know. I love um, them. <laughs> I do love numbers. Um, so moving on, just thinking about now the complexity of the situation in um, Victoria, Matthew, and I know, so we've, for those of you that don't know, um, so Victoria, we've had one lockdown in um, the last term, so term two, we're in lockdown, we've gone back, um, back into lockdown. In lockdown, we have remote learning for most of our students. It has, hasn't been for year 11 and 12, but now with the COVID um, pandemic situation in Victoria, we are going to full remote learning. And I guess I wanted to ask you, Matthew, what have you learned from that first term in lockdown that is transferable to the second term? And how do you think collaboration can really occur online? Um, yeah, I've been spoiled. I'm only teaching year 11 and year 12. So I've actually had live 3D students, which oh, for lovely. some people, has, they haven't had that. So um, it's going to be interesting jumping back tomorrow. But I think we can actually learn from other areas that have gone through disruption. You know, across the world, we've reinvented what we do as teachers in you know, sometimes a matter of days. Um, I, I think you know, it, we should all have a... a pat on the back, um, but we can learn from other areas. Um, and I think taking it down to a, a few things in terms of content, presentation or style and the tools and we techniques that we use. So um, give you a little analogy. My um, mate, Zach, is the executive chef at Lucy Lou's in Melbourne's beautiful Asian fusion restaurant, if you ever get the chance. Um, right. And I, I was thinking about the, yeah, just getting you hungry for dinner time. I know. I'm thinking about dumplings now. This is not <laughs> positive. <laughs> so last time I went up there, I think it was before I um, went vegetarian and I had some sashimi, some, um, some sumai uh, prawn dumplings and some uh, turmeric cauliflower. And that's pretty easy. That's what they do. That's their, their content. Um, their style and presentation is plate it up, take it out. Um, working in a commercial kitchen, it was ready to serve from the past on, onto the um, uh client um, in, in uh, you know, a, a matter of seconds. Um, they're now at the stage that they've become a takeaway business. Um, and I guess the content's similar, maybe not exactly the same. I, I can order a, a takeaway meal for Zach if I wasn't so far out of the city. Uh, but their style and presentation is completely different. So that they've got new packaging, they're doing takeaway, their tools, they're still working in a commercial kitchen. Um, but they need to adjust the, the techniques that they use to consider the freshness of home delivery. So taking that across to teaching, I think w our content has changed a little bit um, because we still, you know, we're still teaching English, we're still teaching maths, we're, we're still teaching the subjects that we were teaching. Uh, but I think we need to pair it back or modify that um, core curriculum. Um, you know, for the right context that, that we're in, depending on how often you're teaching, depending on the resources that your student community has. Um, so there's definitely some thinking that goes around there. Style and presentation, I think teachers shouldn't try to go from, you know, it, it, from if you were a slight Luddite, a bit of a tech sensitive person and uh, you, you don't try and change yourself overnight, still be the teacher that you are, still have that style and flair that makes you you. Um, but the tools that we're using, I think are really different. So whether that's Padlet, Teams, your chat functions, um, Survey Monkeys, Google Forms, the hundred and thousands of things that, that we can use, Choose a few. Don't 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 do all of them. Um, try to choose those new tools and do them well. Um, but don't forget some of our old tools. You know, 
random questioning classes, low stakes quizzes, um, they're really effective. Don't throw the baby out with the bathwater. Uh, but our techniques with those tools might have changed. Um, so even the old tools, where you might update that low stakes quiz to put it on a Kahoot or a Quizlet or you know something that you weren't um, doing before. And when you're using those techniques, you're going to have to refine them. They're different. I, I think the first round of RFL, I felt like a first year teacher for my first couple of weeks teaching because it was, was different. So give yourself the space, take some time out there to practice those new techniques and deliberate practice is what gets us better at anything. It is. And look, I, I applaud you and I applaud all the educators across Australia and the world for turning around the profession and doing it so quickly and so professionally and in some cases it was there was a well this week there's been a day hasn't there there's a curriculum day today and tomorrow's online so hats off to all the educators everywhere that are just doing their best for all their students in this pandemic situation including my son I'm grateful grateful for you all all right, so in that, that spirit of gratefulness and, and also putting my teacher hat on and in thinking about the complexity of the classroom, so we've all come from a, a teaching background in this panel and we all know that every student comes to us from a different place. So there will be some students that have additional learning needs, there'll be other students that are coming to us that are more advanced than their peers, there'll be other students that are coming to us that are currently lower achieving than their peers. How is it that we can make um, collaborative learning work for them? And I'll start off with you, Matt, and then I'll turn to you, Pauline, if you can go off the wise words that you were saying about online learning and continue on with that, Matt, that would be great. Okay, so I guess in terms of supporting a range of students, particularly students with um, additional needs, I, I don't Feel like I've got enough experience to comment on a special school um, but a, a mainstream primary um, and secondary school I think that the principles are the same for all students no matter where their point of need is um, uh, for me the sort of eight steps that I'd consider in when to implement that collaborative learning so um, is go back to what I said before is that collaborative learning going to add value okay if so yes if not don't do it um, if yes, what assessment do you need to do to work out where the students are up to? And you hold so much of that content knowledge in your head. Um, I, I think sometimes, and I'm an absolute fan like Tanya of an effect size or some educational research, but sometimes that data is that you know that you can do the think fair share really quickly with that class. That, that's extremely valuable. Um, but consider the, the knowledge that the students have got, what they need to engage in in the task. And this might be different for different students. So sometimes that, that differentiation might be quickly preloading a few students with what they might need to participate. But knowing your students is key. Um, number four, considering those uh, supports. So sentence starters, timers, talking sticks, um, defined group roles um, that are going to make that structured learning environment work doesn't mean the students can't be creative it just means that we're, we're heading towards the target that we want to go to on some railway tracks um, but this might need to be differentiated so that could be by task it could be additional support um, or your expectations or even different learning intentions for different students number five have a go um, you know ha have fun um, so check check for understanding um, afterwards, during, that's the you know, sort of golden rule of teaching is work out where the students are at and then check afterwards if your intended message actually becomes an enacted message. Um, adjust your teaching accordingly um, and have a bit of fun in terms of would be my last point that you are uh, one of the collaborative learners in a collaborative learning space. We can learn from our, our students as well. Um, sometimes that's them keeping me up to date on pop culture and not making me feel so old, but other times it's, you can learn some really deep and interesting things from our students. So in terms of some strategies like that, um, I think a classic text is um, Doug Lemos, Teach Like a Champion. There's some really good strategies that go along there if um, people are looking for some additional reading. Beautiful, thank you, Matthew. That was fantastic, I love the, um 
yeah, the depth and the breadth that you presented there and the importance really of the individual, understanding the individual student and also the willingness to just give things a go sometimes. All right, Pauline, I'll hand to you to answer that now. What do you yeah, think um, in terms of additional needs? I think I um, want to echo what Matt just said, and he really made me feel, I mean, I really miss teaching. Suddenly yeah, I, I know, I, I did too. I was, <laughs> express. It's I know, I was like, oh, I miss my year 12. Yeah, I miss going back to, I really want to go back to the classroom one day. That's my, my, my dream. Um, <laughs> my happen. But back to the questions. <laughs> so, um, I think what we generally do in the classroom that works for our students uh, we should keep thinking about those strategies, even in collaborative design activities. So what are some of the good interventions that work, you know, versus those that didn't work so well, is that teachers intentionally make those um, collaboration um, activities designed in such a way that will work for their context and their needs of their students. So they are designed at, uh, ahead of time, they are thought through, you know, in terms of uh, what is going to be discussed, how the students are going to be grouped, um, and also thinking through the soft skills. How are they going to be feedbacking each other, providing that kind of a check-ins with one another, um, and so on and so forth. So I think generally th those are the kind of um, key ingredients. Um, students need to build those, uh, have opportunities to build those soft skills for it to happen, and for students with additional learning needs. They have less of self-concept of their learning. You know, they're struggling in certain sub-concepts. They need to build those confidence and the motivation to participate in, especially in a team where there's mixability and where some of their peers might be higher performing than them. So how do we make them and make them feel that they are valued in the team and that their, their, their contributions is also important? I think one of the, I think teachers can think about mechanism that we can put into provide those opportunities, like um, setting and establishing group agreements before um, collaborative learning starts. So having students to talk about what kind of expectations and how would they treat each other and how would they communicate positively about each other's work. Uh, also giving feedback and how do they do that by listening to each other at, um, actively? How do they focus on strong communication to be skilled collaborators in the process of learning? Um, and you're also thinking through things like um, peer coaching throughout the whole process of collaboration. So they could have a collaboration lock where students um, can lock into a document where they um, sort of uh, assess each other's progress, efforts, and um, attitudes towards um, their learning, not in a competitive way, but in a constructive way. So back to the question about com competition, right? It has, it shouldn't be used to pit against each other or uh, across all teams, but it should be used in a way where competition is used to, to build confidence and motivation. So motivation drives success and performance. So I wouldn't say that competition is not good, but it has to be constructive and uh, works in a way where, you know, there's certain rewards, uh, not, uh, uh, not extrinsic rewards. Maybe sometimes it can be like, for example, early, early release for recess. I think our, our <laughs> students love that. I remember as teacher, uh, primary school students love that. <laughs> they just run out of the classroom. That's what, what I experienced. Uh, that's making me feel like I want to go back to classrooms again. <laughs> so, yeah, so I think that, that's, that's all from me for this question. Beautiful. Thank you, Pauline. And we're running, unfortunately, out of time. So I'm just going to skip to the very last question, um, which was, what are some key takeaways? I know there's no silver bullet, but what are some key takeaways that you would like the audience to take home with them tonight in regards to what are some evidence-based approaches you think that are essential to effective collaboration? I'll start with you, Matthew, and then end with you, Pauline. Um, I, I think at that classroom level, I sort of went through my points before, but it's also how far you could push it. I had a year seven English class that um, I think nearly taught themselves for a month because I had actually pushed them that far and we'd done a lot of pre-learning and they went through and they were teaching the classes with, they had a starter, they had learning intentions up, they had some amazing things, did the work to get the prior knowledge there. Um, 
but we can push students really far when we're doing so. Have fun, give it a go. Uh, on some structural levels, I'd um, like to make some more comments though. So on a domain or key learning um, area, what are the tasks that are beneficial um, for your students to collaborate on? What are the tasks that are not so beneficial within your um, learning area? And what are the strategies that might work for your learning area? Um, on a school level, um, so your number one go, going um, back to further research is you know the, the the ground the grounding of everything is are are your classrooms safe and supportive? Um, yeah. Because we need to have that in place before we do something that is uh, a bit more challenging at times, such as collaborative learning. Um, what professional learning um, do your staff need to do to maximise? Um, their collaborative learning experience. Um, if you're going to run some professional development, how are you actually going to go through and evaluate if that's worked and if staff are going to implement them? Do you have a coaching program um, behind that? And then also how do um, your key learning areas or domains actually go through and evaluate your, their curriculum and the collaborative learning impact on that? They're, they're big questions. Um, so, you know, they're not always easy answers. Um, one thing, and I might put it up in the chat in a second, um, on the evaluation of um, professional learning, I've got a blog post I've written that's on um, Thomas Gutsky's um, five levels of feed, um, data feedback. Um, so that's something to maybe consider because that's a harder one for schools to do. Yeah, I love a bit of Gutsky in the afternoon. Beautiful, thank you. Um, Pauline. Yeah, I'll so just key takeaway. Right. Sorry, we're, we're running oh. out of time. So, Antonia, I'm... Um, can you push back the slides to the previous on the intervention? So, I thought I would just end with one of the interventions that we found was really successful. So, this um, one, uh, the next one. Yeah. Yeah. So, this is one example of a maths collaborative strategy where students are assigned to mixability teams and they are highly motivated to empower each other to learn. So, I think in summary, I just want to say that you know. Um, give the students the opportunities to help each other and draw on each other's strengths. And don't be afraid that, you know, uh, that the, the high performing students will not be able to, 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 to you know, maximize their learning, but in fact, they're actually building other skill sets that are critical, like, you know, besides their domain areas of studying, they're actually building a lot of soft skills to help and support um, other learners in the process of learning. And think about the assessment for learning, which is critical and how to check in and evaluate students um, monitoring their progress individually and in groups and even solving some of the conflicts and negotiation issues that might happen during the collaborative learning. This is critical before things get quite serious because we know that children and students might get into certain conflicts and they're not ready to do that in a very productive way and teachers should be there to guide them to solve their issues and negotiate through so that they could participate with one another more productively and um, I think positive Interaction is really what I want to end my um, my sharing. That's that's it. Beautiful, and that is the key: positive interaction. And hopefully, everyone tonight has had that. Um, these are some up and coming webinars that we have coming up that you can feel free to register for. Um, if you want to get in touch with us, please feel free. You can contact myself or um, Pauline, and then if as well you'd like to contact Matt, we can reach out to him. Will everyone who's attended will receive a certificate? So if you've attended, you'll receive one automatically. That will be sent to you in a week's time. So keep an eye on your inbox for that. The full recording will go up as well, and we're on all the socials as well but I would like to just finish off by thanking my panel especially thank you to Matthew for giving your time so generously tonight um, amidst a pandemic situation and increased workload that you already have with being an assistant principal really really appreciate your practical insights that you provided and I can see here Pleasure. on that we're getting on the chat is just absolutely lighting up with how practical it was. And that's what we really want to be to the profession. So thank you for sharing your expertise and 
I, what I love is that your ability to translate from the evidence into practice. So thank you for that. And thank you to Pauline as well for um, bringing us really specific examples from the literature and the evidence base and clarifying those for us, how that can actually occur within the classroom. Thank you both so much for your time. And thank you to everyone who attended tonight for taking an hour out of your incredibly busy educator schedules from across the world. And we had people from America to the Philippines to everywhere tonight. So thank you for all joining us and we'll see you here again soon and take care. There's a survey we'll send through if you wanna give us any feedback on how to improve on any other sessions and just thanks. All right, Thank take care, you. everyone, and stay safe and well, please. Thank you.